Welcome to Detroit in Black and White. Uh, if anyone can hear us, uh, uh, welcome. Today we've got a we've got a great show. Today we've got uh, Ira Todd, who's a uh, retired police detective, a consultant for Hollywood, and we have uh, Ed Sarpolis, who's going to join us first. He's a uh, pollster, uh, and we'll be talking about the election. And then we have uh, Michael Williams and Al Stone, real estate uh, partners. They're going to talk about uh, the Detroit Brightmore neighborhood and some of the events that are happening there. So, welcome. Are, are we no getting more. some? Are we getting some sound here? All right. Are, can anyone hear us out there? Good morning. Good morning, All Detroit right. in black and white. Um, Adolph Mongo will be zooming in. I am Vanessa Moss lawyer and political consultant. We have Alan Lango, who's here this morning, Deadline Detroit, and uh, what was the name of that paper in middle school, the American Eagle? Oh, the Eagle American. <laughs> Eagle, American. Eagle American. So we're here at McShane's on the corner of Michigan Avenue in Trumbull. We invite our viewers to come down here to McShane's, come down and have some breakfast. We thank the owner of McShane's for allowing us to be here live every Saturday. We are encouraging everyone to come down and, you know, participate. Um, if you are watching this podcast, we're asking that you like, share, and subscribe. Like, share, and subscribe. So we're going to wait for Adolf to come in, but while we're waiting for him, All we right, can start with that. All right, here we with, uh, go. We're going to bring Adolf Oh, in. he's here. Okay. Hey. Adolf, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Well, welcome. Uh, we're going to go right straight to the outrage of the week. Uh, Vanessa, what's your outrage of the week? So my outrage of the week is uh, what happened to Winter, the little girl who lived in Lansing with her mom. And uh, she's two years, two years old. And this monster, because that's exactly what he is, this monster decides to kidnap her after she and the mom he and the mom had some differences. He stabbed the mom. Mom runs out the house for safety. He takes the baby. He drives the baby from Lansing, kills the baby with a cell phone cord, and drops her off in the city of Detroit. I am outraged. I am pissed off. And you know what? As a defense attorney, I understand that people have defenses. But in some cases, you know, it's a slam dunk. In this case, and this is coming from me, Prison is not good enough for him. Street justice is what should happen to this it, guy. It, it, this guy it, is a piece of S H I T. Is it? He's is a it, monster. Is he, isn't he facing a death penalty? This is a federal case. Yeah, but you know what? I don't want him to wait. Right, I don't well, want. I don't. I don't even want them to wait. I don't even want him to go through the process. Goodbye. And the, Good riddance. And, and the bad thing that come out of this is that people are. Uh, putting up uh, GoFundMe right. pages, uh, and taking money from folks uh, in the name of this little young girl. And what was real sad is that the father of this young girl, who is a, a student at the University of Tennessee Martin and a football player, right. man, if you have to uh, hear him and see him, it's, it's heartbreaking uh, just to listen to him. And he if it wasn't for the university and a, a football coach, the guy couldn't have got here. You know, he'd get a call saying that his daughter's been kidnapped, et cetera. Right. You know, it just this it, this is just ridiculous. People have no 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 they don't not care about whether this is a kid, a baby, or or, or a senior citizen. But but you know what what is really out I mean even more outrageous is the fact that he and the mother has a child together. She's living, so she has to live with the child that she and he created. I can't imagine the amount of stress and trauma 
that this has caused for her and will continue to cause for her mm -hmm. because she has to look at that child that she created with this piece of shit. Well, shit. Yes. Nope. Piece of shit. Uh, Alan, your outrage of the week. Um, my, my outrage of the week is, is that, you know, the Republican, you know, the whole January 6th thing and, and the overturning of the election, uh, we've seen the Republicans screaming about voter fraud from the moment, actually pre-election in 2020. Trump was already trying to yell voter fraud, and they have tried to perpetrate the biggest voter fraud in, in American history trying to have the folk, the fake electorates, uh, trying to pressure people to overturn the elections, trying to pressure legislate lawmakers. They brought in, you know, Trump had two of the Michigan lawmakers come to the White House to try to overturn stuff. We saw the biggest, biggest perpetration of voter fraud, attempted voter fraud in this country. And some people are just blowing it off and they just are being so cavalier about it. We've never seen anything. Look, if any president, previous president had tried that, they would have been gone in a second. This guy, you know, I mean, he remained in office till the very last day. Trump should have been removed for all the horseshit. And and now we're, we're playing it out. And some people are just like, oh, you're picking on the guy. <clears throat> Let's move on. This has been the most shameful, you know, it, it's just shameful at that level, the, the voter fraud that was attempted. But, but let me ask you this, Alan. Yes. You said that, haven't we moved on though? Have we no. moved Haven't on? Haven't we moved on though? I mean, they're, do, no. they're doing the, no. the January 6th, but I, I'm saying as a country, we've moved on. People, you know, talk about it much, but people overall, they want to move on. They don't want to talk about that. They're looking at what we're going to talk about in a few minutes, the next election. But What's going to happen but there, at the next but, election? But you, I mean, it, it depends on your, your point of view. I mean, if you watch MSNBC, CNN, uh, they're talking right. about the Jack Smith investigation. Right. That's still that's still going. It's a drama that's playing out. I mean, it's a you know entertaining drama. I mean, you couldn't if we had predicted this you know five seven years ago. If you had turned on a Netflix film and started watching that, you'd be like, <laughs> No, come on, that could never happen. Right. That person would be out of there in a minute. Instead, the tolerance here in this country for for the horseshit and people don't care anymore. I mean, they're so. I mean, on both sides, people are like, I don't care. Screw that person. Uh, nobody, the, the sense of justice, the sense of honesty is just, you know, the currency of honesty is, but, is but nobody, lowered. But nobody gives a fuck about uh, January 6th now, but they do, uh, as we move on, here's Trump giving out the addresses of Obama, and then you right. have a, a, a nut... Uh, he right over there. They went. He right. went right to the address, and he and he was ready to uh, lock and load. So right. listen, we he need to be locked up, but he's not going to get locked up. Uh, he's going to be uh, campaigning. He's going to get a, another indictment down in Georgia. He might get indicted in New right. Jersey, and then he, he he pressured the folks in Arizona to change uh, the tap, the voting tally. So he can right. be indicted in five, six states, and he's still running for president, and it's right. still too close to call. But you know what? You know what's an interesting sort of conundrum for him is that his buddy Walt, uh, his his sidekick there, uh, Mini-Me, is, is been arraigned now. Right. And so, look, the FBI and the Justice Department went to him and said, basically... Look, you've got to cooperate with us. They're, they don't care about that guy. He's a small fish. But because he's being a stand-up guy, he's going to have to go to prison and for what he did. And yet, so how do you how do you send that guy who's a small fish, and how do you send him to prison and not send Trump to prison? He's Trump. Just like they, That's just how. Like they, just That's like how. They, he's Trump. <laughs> Just like they sent all these other low-level people to prison, right. and, and the and the and the big fish. He's the crime boss. He's well, I mean, Trump's the crime boss. This guy. Well, the crime so boss is not going to jail. Not uh, my. Yeah. Let's say not jail, prison. You mean prison? He's not going to prison. My yeah. my my outrage is uh, Ryan Waters, the uh, 
the state superintendent of Oklahoma who says that the that the only way you can talk about the Tulsa race uh, massacre is not to mention race. It had nothing to do with black people. Right. Is it, it had nothing to do with black people. So if, if you can't mention race when you talk about uh, in Oklahoma lynching, segregation, uh, any uh, Ku Klux Klan, you know, if, if we look at Ron DeSantis if, and his Florida is, if he becomes president, he want a military that goes back to where black folks can't be part of the Marine Corps. Uh, if they're in the Navy, they they got to be a cook. Uh, if they're in the Army, they do cleanup duty. This is Ron DeSantis' version of uh, none of that ever happened. There was no lynchings in Florida. There was no segregation. Everything was fine. You can't, you know, you talk about you can't read a book by Langston Hughes or Zora uh, Neal Hurst. You know, she's from Florida, and right. you can't read her book. But this takes us back to the turn of, 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 of the 20th century when they outlawed the Chicago Defender newspaper saying that if they caught black people reading it, they was going to lynch them or send them to prison. So it, it, some things change and some don't. So it's, yeah. when you want to talk about uh, Reconstruction and, and the Civil War, you can't not mention race. You can't mention uh, right. black people. And now we got rid of affirmative action. Who are the little privileged kids, the uh, Asians and, uh, and, and, and these privileged uh, legacy folks are going to blame for not getting into certain schools? Now they don't have black and brown uh, students to blame. Well, I didn't get into Harvard because they gave it to a black person or they gave it to Vanessa's daughter or Vanessa's son. Now who are they going to blame uh, when they can't get into these schools? We'll see. So, well, uh, as I as I indicated last week, I submit that there's going to be a way to get around checking that box. One, two. Um, I also stand on the fact that you're going to have a high influx of people going to HBCUs, and as you know, a few years back there were schools that were closing because of low enrollment, um, but. Uh, you know, I'm going to encourage the enrollment at HBCUs. And as I said last week, good morning. As I said last week, you know, <clears throat> my son is a, a product of a HBCU. So, I mean, it is what it is. But I suspect <laughs> that, listen, education is, you know, as much as it's education, it's a money grab. They do not want to turn away that money. Right. That was the well, real one of the reasons why HBCUs were failing is because, you know, we're dying because, the bigger schools were getting these students. So do you really think that these educators at these universities are going to say, we're going to turn away this money? Absolutely not. Well, There's going to be a way to go and get around. You know what's going to hurt them when, when, when these athletes say, okay, Ron DeSantis, you don't want us down here. We don't go to University of Florida. We don't go to Florida State. We don't go to Miami and play Football, which generates millions and millions of dollars, basketball. We don't let let them feel a team that they want to feel. So they want they 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 want a sterile environment. Let them have sterile. It's uh, not going to happen program. though. We got to we got to do a commercial. But anyway, gonna, let's let's do a commercial. We're let's do a commercial, and then we're going to bring Ed Ed Sarpolo on. Okay. I'm Wayne County Treasurer Eric Sabri. We are living through unprecedented times. As a result, the Michigan Homeowner Assistance Fund was created. This fund, administered by the state of Michigan, is designed to help homeowners cope with pandemic-related hardships, such as delinquent property taxes. Residents may apply for up to $25,000 to help cover 2019, 2020, and 2021 tax years. Previous year's taxes must be paid in full or in a payment agreement with the treasurer's office. Eligible homeowners must have a qualified financial hardship that occurred on or after January 21st, 2020. You must currently own and occupy your home as your primary residence and must have owned it since January 21st, 2020. To see if you qualify, please visit waynemetro.org. Call 313-388-9799.
or email textinfo at waynecounty.com. We're here to help. Welcome back. Uh, Ed, how you doing? I'm doing good. Very well. Very quickly, I think, uh, Ellen, I think you need to learn from your host. You need to have her braid your hair. <laughs> <laughs> if, I, if only I could. Well, he could get yeah, extensions. We got his, I mean, from we're creative Target. now. He could get extensions. He could get okay, extensions. Okay, well, and Margo's going to have to get a, a wig like Sharia Richardson did on the racetrack, I think. Uh, yeah, well, I'm going to get a Bill Bonds. Uh, <laughs> I uh, couldn't uh, resist that. <laughs> but anyway... <laughs> I want to ask you a question before we really get into uh, uh, politics. What uh, we had uh, uh, Dr. Cornell West on last week. What role is he going to play in this Michigan uh, election, if any? What do you think? I think he's going to have a major more bigger than you think. And let me explain why. Since 2012, the black community has beginning to divide itself. Those outside of Wayne County are leaning more Republican or independent. And we're seeing, especially the black male, and I've done polling on this now for the last four years. Secondly, we also have, besides the, the Cornell West is basically, a matter of fact, Jill Stein, who basically hurt uh, uh, Hillary Clinton, chances of winning in 2016. He basically can be a spoiler. Okay. Uh, and bottom line is, is I've, I listened to his talk. I've listened to some of the, the side things going to the Green Party. They view this as an opportunity to take out Joe Biden because listen to this. Only a third of Republicans are looking for an alternative candidate than Trump. But 45 percent of Democrats are looking for an alternative to Joe Biden. Absolutely. So Cornell West could be another Jill Stein or Ralph Nader, for those of us who are young enough to remember yeah. Uh, you know, you know, basically places. So Cornel West is a very, and remember, he's very well educated in Harvard and Yale. He's been in movies like The Matrix, uh, though he views as more Marxist and that type of thing. But the bottom line, he's a player. He has access to money. And I would say the fact that he could have a major role and potentially for Joe Biden to take the victory uh, coming up. And also, you got to remember, this is the third party of no party candidate. If it was Joe Manchin. So bottom line, Biden is not off the hook, even if Trump is the nominee. And do you see Joe Manchin actually jumping in, or is that is that a a valid thing? Or well, the the, the point being, there's more. Th what's happening is the fact not that not necessary that what they're trying to do because many of the leaders of this third party group is from Michigan, like Jeff Timmer, Bob LeBrant, and other things like that. But they don't understand if you pick the wrong candidate, since there's such a large number of Democrats looking for alternative. That gonna hurt. Joe Manchin obviously is that other alternative in other parts of the country. He's not necessarily in. But I could see him holding it out as a, as a thing of getting his votes out of Congress. Is he, is he going to run for re-election? Well, Manchin? we don't know that yet. Right, right now, obviously, he has the money. His problem right now is polling numbers starting to d dissipate in support in West Virginia. So his concern is the fact is, is that he's beginning to lose some support. Why and the governor, hey, the governor uh, is... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go I, I want to go back to you talked about the, the black electorate. <clears throat> There's a divide in the black electorate. Basically, they're looking more for someone other than Joe Biden and that Cornell West may be the per person. How is it with the what what is it? How is he polling with the wider electorate in Michigan? Do you know? The Cornell West basically would have really as, as of today would have no presence. That's why they're bringing in Jill Stein, who had a major presence in 2016. So you and I and those of us who follow what's going Cornell West is a player in the black community. OK, he has an outreach, he has awareness, but that's why they're bringing in Jill Stein to show them how to build that base, because she's going to help return over her, her network to Cornell West. That was announced over the last couple of weeks. Right, right. And so Joe Manchin is uh, the, the governor of, uh, I believe, West Virginia is planning on running for that seat. And he's very popular. And Joe Manchin is really seems to always be struggling there, a Democrat sort of out of place in a very Republican state. Well, th that's the problem is the fact is, is that West Virginia is becoming more Democrat because of the people of, of who, who is moving there. Yeah. Manchin's dependent on the current existing, the much more Southern vote. Because that memory, you look at the Civil War where those lines were, West Virginia was more leaning into the South than it was into the North. So Manchin has always played to that old school politics. So the Democratic governor getting in, that begins to push Manchin's hands. Now, the question is going to be for the Democrats. They have to see what it looks like in the general election. And so what would happen if Manchin's a better choice for the Democrats in the general, they may ease up in their support for the Democratic governor. Why, why Manchin won't become a Republican? 
because in his heart, on most core issues except for the coal industry, he's pretty much leans Democrat. He's a conservative, old style, blue Democrat uh, from the South. Uh, he still has some core issues. And how do you see DeSantis? What's uh, DeSantis and Christie? Christie seems to be really punching away every moment. He's trying to distinguish himself as the true anti-Trump candidate. DeSantis is somewhere. Where, where do you see DeSantis in this whole thing? Well, DeSantis, here's his problem. Right now, 45 percent of the Republican primary vote believe that Trump won. They don't care about the facts. They don't care about right. the truth. Look how they embarrassed Mike Pence uh, this week when he actually said it would have been illegal. The problem with the sense is the fact is the fact he's no longer real because the fact he changes his opinion. So basically he's losing because not because he has to raise $130 million. He doesn't appear real to the people. He doesn't have any charisma. And no, so know. what's happening, even uh, Fred Upton, our congressman who retired, says Donald Trump and Upton's no is not a Trump's uh, supporter. Matter of fact, Fred Upton helped a lot of Democrats get elected as a Republican. So DeSantis problem the fact he's not perceived as a real person. He still might come through as a second choice, but right now Trump is just taking the task. And remember, it's it's the old story. Trump has has his own call that people believe him no matter what he says, and the more you attack him, his support goes up. And here here in problem. Michigan, go ahead. And here here in Michigan, we saw in 2016. Hillary lost by 10,700 votes. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2020, uh, Biden won by 150,000 votes. Yes. Uh, can, uh, obviously, 10,700, Cornell West could have an impact. 150,000, not likely. But how do you see that playing out here in Michigan this time? Is Biden not, is Biden more of a, is it going to be a lot closer with Biden here in Michigan this time? Oh, it, it was it was in 2020. It was a close race when you consider the amount of votes. You got to understand right. it. Well, here's what's going on. Part of the problem, if you look at it, is the black community support was very weak in Michigan and turnout in 2022. OK, if they're not re-motivated, there's a good chunk of that 150,000 votes go away. And remember, if African-Americans move into outstate into Oakland County and Southern Wayne County, they don't have that family gathering of support. Because, For example, if I go around the state. Outside of the core Western Detroit, when I talk to black community in Muskegon or Benton Harbor, they're not really part of the overall argument because we don't do outreach. We're so stuck in Southeast right. Michigan. The black leadership right. is not across the state. That's been my biggest great because right. when I was with the Judge Thomas, we did 30 events in all black communities around the state. And it's like, you're from Detroit and you're right. black. We didn't know that. Right. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, let's go to the Slocken. Is she a shoe in as a U.S. Senator? Or is, uh, what? who do Republicans have to uh, deal with that race? Okay, well, right now, Alicia Slotkin has at least committed on hand $15 million between hard and soft. She's promised another $15 million, up to $30 million if she could, becomes a hot primary, okay? Uh, the, the candidates right now, let me explain what's happening right now. Most of the candidates are running against her, from Ms. Pugh from Saginaw, who got all her county endorsements, or Hill Harper, or uh, Nasser Beydoun is the fact that they have no name recognition. They're non-existent, okay? Lisa Slotkin uh, right now is basically trying to gobble up all, all, all the money. Matter of fact, she's offering money to candidates to get out of the Senate race, and I will fund your race locally in another Gosh. race, okay? And so I would say, now, what's going to happen, though? Here's the key thing, Adolf Mongo. Right now, Republicans are basically don't know what they're going to do. But I will tell you, if Mike Rogers, who's being encouraged to jump into the race— the race is over with Lisa Slotkin. The Democrats will shut down anybody running against Lisa Slotkin and Republicans will pour in millions of dollars because that's that's their white knight. Because Lisa Slotkin would even take out Mike Rogers when he was in Congress. Right. OK, so the bottom line is, is that Lisa Slotkin is right now is the lead because the Democratic family nationwide is there. But that could change depending on what's happened. And the other thing, Lisa Slotkin, why did Lisa Slotkin get the nod nationally? Because when you talk, to, when I was, I would do a lot of consulting to money people, and people says, well, let's look at some polling. Why was Lisa Slotin picked over Jocelyn Benson for the, for the person of choice? Lisa Slotin uh, received more conservative than Jocelyn Benson to take on a presidential year because you feel that you know, if you're too liberal, you're going to lose on a presidential year. That's how Lisa Slotin got. But right now, Mike, Ry Mike Rogers would determine and lock and stone the top two candidates. But nobody in Detroit uh, uh, care about Lee, uh, Slocken. Alyssa Slocken. <laughs> nobody. The trouble, the trouble, right, the trouble is, but they're gonna. Detroit's not gonna represent more than at most eighteen percent of the right. primary vote. Right. That's the problem. Right. right. 
So how how do you get how how do you get past eighteen percent? You have to build name recognition. You're going to have to show that you are speaking. Bottom line is, if I took a candidate who's someone who could raise the money, you have to say, look, in fact, the Democratic family spends no time in Detroit or Wayne County in the off years. Lisa Slotkin didn't spend any time. All the even Gretchen Whitmer did not spend any time in Detroit. So if you take a candidate, maybe right. the trouble with Hill Harper is the fact I don't think he's going to want to spend all his money to run. Okay, right now the only reason he's got money because he's taken out his own pocket. Then he's going to even pay his taxes. Right. Okay. So right. you can Nasser Baydoun, if he could get the money, because he's connected, I don't know, you know, he's connected to labor, he's been involved in Detroit and business, that type of thing. And he's also connected to the Arab and Lebanese community. As you all well know, work with Benny Napoleon. Most of the money came from the Arab Lebanese community for Benny Napoleon. Okay. Uh, Miss Pugh in Saginaw is a great lady, but she has no money access or thing. Uh, Leslie uh, Love, okay, she's in the race. She knows that she's going there on issues. She doesn't have a chance, but I found out for some people early on in the process before Lisa Slotkin was uh, set in stone, the Republicans were looking to support Lisa, Lisa Love because they wanted somebody as an alternative to Jocelyn Benson. So there's money out there to alternative Jocelyn. The question is, is that who can get the name recognition quick? And no question. Uh, and, and when you say uh, name recognition quick, how how quickly are we talking? Because, I mean, we're... Well, right now, anybody who's going to be Lisa Slotkin by, by October 15th needs a million and a half dollars in the kitty to start building their name. They're not even going to do it. That's uh, quickly. Right. Uh, Mike Duggan wants... Is, is he running for governor? He's doing his best to say no, but on, underneath he wants to say yes. Absolutely. And what, we what, know that. Where does that, 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 that leave the lieutenant governor at? Pardon? Where do that leave the lieutenant governor? Well, the, the trouble with uh, Garland Gilchrist wants to run for mayor of Detroit. The trouble is the fact is, is that when you look at polling, he's not doing too well in Detroit. Uh, even Mary Sheffield, who lead, now leads polling, is still not a lock. This is kind of funny because people always pick on me when I do this. I did this with Keith Williams. Surprising or not, even if I do a poll today, the top candidate, though she won't get the money to run or to run, is Sherry McPhail because she has the best name recognition and respect hey, in the city. Wow. She, she didn't have right. the best name recognition in She didn't do shit. Real, so I know that I'm just saying the fact, but she's consistently on. Remember, as you well know, Vanessa, you know this. The right. bulk of the voters in Detroit that are state are, are senior citizens or those who grew up around <laughs> Sherry McPhail in office. Right. What, real, right. real quick, Whitmer. What do you see with Whitmer? What's what's everyone's trying to push her in? Uh, she won't run in 2024, but uh, you see her as a candidate in 2020. Oh, I think her ego wants to run in four years. And here's the difficulty with Gretchen: she's never had a tough election. She's yeah. never been tested. She's never been tested in a debate. Yeah. But right now, she reminds me not the fact that she can't necessarily get the nod, but the point being, Governor Snyder Angler. When he was going to be the choice, they did national focus groups of his, and eighty percent people said no to him. So Gretchen Whitmer, like Granholm, may not get that. Granholm tried and failed. They, right. Gretchen right. has yet to be tested. Well, right. no question. Uh, All right. Uh, quickly before we go, uh, reparations is that an issue? Campaign issue. Uh, reparations, if it's done the way the Black Caucus is trying to do it in Detroit, it's a good issue because of the fact it doesn't show like we're going to be doing financial handouts. Okay. If a reparations, for, it bombed in California, okay, because who's going to pay for it? Right. That's the difficulty. Right. You know, Ann Arbor is right. right now trying to do a guaranteed income. Who's right. going to end up paying for it? And I, as a matter of fact, quickly, the reparation program that Keith and Black Caucus, what Michelle was working on, we got support. Remember, I was working part of that. When we did polling, even White supported it because it wasn't going to be a hand that was going to build up in the communities. Everybody benefited up besides the Black community. Well, we hopefully, if they tear down 375, that the only people that's going to own the property over there is the <laughs> images and Gary Targo and that bunch. So right. you know, this is what I hear in the community. Oh, right? I agree with you. I yeah, agree with you 100%. I agree. And yeah. I want to say uh, that Ed one last so question. Is, one, last wanna... question. one last question. Go ahead. Wayne County Sheriff race. Ray Washington <laughs> said, can he be beat? Yes. That Matter of fact, a, a, an old lady with a million dollars can beat him. That ain't no question. Yes, I <laughs> you know a lady with a million dollars that can beat him? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and thanks, hey, and let me put the this one here. You just, I, I'll guarantee you, I'm, not, I'm joking here. The fact is that there are a lot of rich, wealthy women out there, including black women, okay, that if they find a man that they like, they're going to take him on. 
<laughs> no, no question. Thanks, Ed. I just want to say Ed Sarpolis <laughs> as in 2022 predicted a lot of the races spot on. And so when people criticize some pollsters out there, I mean, Ed did an amazing job of predicting accurately. In fact, uh, the Levin camp was angry when we published one of his polls saying they were, you know, Haley Stevens was ahead by 20 points and they were mad and they were trashing Ed and he won by. He I don't. I don't know why points. Levin got mad because he he should have just ran over in the new district. Well, one yeah, thing yeah. for your listeners: the fact is, I was born and raised in Detroit. My family came to Detroit in 1890. I, I I come back to Detroit regularly. I still got family there, and I go around the city and the state. You have to be in the community to know what's going on before you can predict polls. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Dad, thanks so Thank much. You. We're going to do a commercial, and we're going to bring on Ira Todd next. Okay. Thanks, Dad. Thank you you Thank have you. a good one. I'm Wayne County Treasurer Eric Sabri. We are living through unprecedented times. As a result, the Michigan Homeowner Assistance Fund was created. This fund, administered by the state of Michigan, is designed to help homeowners cope with pandemic-related hardships, such as delinquent property taxes. Residents may apply for up to $25,000 to help cover 2019, 2020, and 2021 tax years. Previous year's taxes must be paid in full or in a payment agreement with the treasurer's office. Eligible homeowners must have a qualified financial hardship that occurred on or after January 21st, 2020. You must currently own and occupy your home as your primary residence and must have owned it since January 21st, 2020. To see if you qualify, please visit waynemetro.org, call 313-388-9799 or email taxinfo at waynecounty.com. We're here to help. Welcome okay. back. Okay. We are. Welcome back to Detroit okay. Black Night, uh, with Alan Langle and Vanessa uh, Moss. Uh, uh, we we got Ira Ty. We haven't had him on before. How you doing? Hey, good. How you doing, Dad? Hey, uh, hey Ira. So hey. let me. Hey, Vanessa, how you doing? Hey, Ira. Okay. Hey. One question I want, we haven't had all these uh, shootings around the country, Ira, and it, it, it's out of control. What's can we, for, first of all, can we just, I, I'm sorry you know, to interrupt, but I, just a, a real quick introduction. Ira Todd is a retired Detroit police detective. He's been a consultant for uh, Hollywood. And also uh, he's just, he's an Emmy award winning, one of a group of people, including Charlie LaDuff, who has won an Emmy Award for a documentary on uh, gun violence in Detroit? Can we can we play a little bit of this before we get going, uh, Adolf? Uh, yeah, go ahead. All right, let me. Uh, what? The leading cause of death among our children. It's not accidents. It's not illness. It's gun violence. Why is my daughter shot? Why is an innocent two-year-old shot? Why is anybody's child shot? In the chest. Five-year-old shot in the chest. It was just firecrackers, and then the car started dinging, and next thing I know it, she was screaming. It was just, why? Why would you do that to him? Thirteen shots in all went into this home. Tonight out of America's iconic motor city, Detroit, waving the white flag. The homicide rate is at its highest in 40 years dubbed Murder City with 78,000 abandoned buildings. 900 children have been shot in those nine years since Detroit's historic bankruptcy. Last week on the way to see Sesame Street live, Durham angrily rolling down the window, pointing the gun at the car and firing a single shot. A little boy dying the next day. Is your son a monster? No, he's not. All righty. All right. Okay, go ahead, Adolf. I'm sorry. Oh, that's oh, right. 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 off your trophy. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Emmy Award winning. Okay. As I was saying, man, it's like the 4th of July was like, even the wild, wild west wasn't this wild on the 4th of July. What's the solution? You know what? We hear and we see all this uh, death and destruction every day, it, whether it's Detroit whether it's in Texas, whether it's Baltimore. in California, it doesn't matter. Where would, how can it end and what can we do about it, Ira? Well, you know, Adolph, really, you know, I've been doing this like 40-something years in law enforcement. 
And it's really no difference. I think the real difference is the media coverage, social media, and everything else. We see a lot more of it now. But years ago, we used to, like police officers, we would see it like this stuff all the time, all day long, all year long. And basically, you know, nobody get to see it like we get to see it now. And you guys are getting exposed to it like we were getting exposed to it. So it may seem chaotic, but if you look at the numbers, they up a little bit. But it's been this crazy for a long time. And guns been around for a long time. And we got to be honest, nobody's getting rid of their guns. They, they do a gun recall back, whatever they want to do, legislation, whatever, like people start hiding their guns. And then what they'll do, they'll make these guns illegal now. So, you know, that's that's not a solution. I know people say, well, we got to get these guns back. Nobody's turning their guns in. From the illegal right. ones, you might have somebody turn on buybacks, get $50 for these raggedy guns they'll turn in or something like that, or somebody want them out their house or something like that. But, but for the most part, yeah, gun advocates and people buying these assault rifles and everything else, they're not giving up their guns. And I don't think it's a gun problem myself. I think it's a violent problem. Because we I, 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 mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. I don't think it's a gun problem, but I think it's violence itself. And I, I submit that you can't legislate it. You can't. We can sit here and talk about it. But like you said, this has been going on forever. OK. And I think that the older we get, the older we're blessed enough to be here on this earth, the more we say that we see. That's because we've been here a long time. OK. Right. Right. Um, but. People have to police themselves. And if people do, if we don't have a change in society, if we don't have a change in mindset, it's going to continue. So, you know, you can have all these marches, you can have all this legislation passed, but listen, people break laws because they want to break laws. If you, you know, if you want to carry a gun, you're going to carry a gun, whether you license or not, whether you bought a registered gun or not. But, but the, I think the real issue is why? Why are people carrying guns? Why are people buying all these guns? Why are people toting guns in the neighborhood? You know, why are people toting illegal guns? Why are people toting legal guns? You know, open carry. Guys walk around with open carry downtown and stuff like that. They want to make a point. But what it is, people are afraid out here. And there's a lot of fear being created out here. And so people are walking around saying, hey, look here. You know what? I'd rather be caught with it than without it. Absolutely. So I think there is, we can like start talking about, you know, this whole issue because what it is, it's like a, a coward with a gun in his hand is going to create a mass shooting. A coward with a gun in his hand is going to shoot up somebody's house, not knowing who's in the house and kill somebody's little baby. That's the real issue. It's these cowards with guns. We got a lot of legal gun owners. We got a lot of cops out here. We got a lot of doctors. We got lawyers. We got everybody that love guns, love hunting love guns just for the hobby of the whole thing. We're not getting rid of guns. It was written into the Second Amendment, right? So we're not getting rid of guns, period. But we got to get rid of these cowards. You know, but, guys but what about, don't even fight. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Sorry, Alan, go ahead. Ira, what, what about the ban? They, they showed when there was a ban on AK-47s that we eventually saw a decline. And, and also the fact that AK-47s can, can do more damage than a, a nine millimeter, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be uh, make sense to at least start? I know there's so many. You and I have talked about this before. I mean, social, you know, uh, education, uh, social services, everything, economics, all play into to to the gun violence. But wouldn't it make sense to start and try to at least start to lower the population of AK-47s out there that make it so easy you can go to gun shows anywhere and pick up an ak-47 you can go to the local gun shop uh would that not help to at least start somewhere we're, we're not starting anywhere well people get guns alan the the criminals is not uh, uh they don't care about uh a license check or mental health checks or whatever they're going to get a gun they're going to get a gun i, 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 I want to go out on the street and get a gun i can get a gun can i and whether it's an AKA 47 or what, whatever you called it, it doesn't matter if, if it's a 45. A gun is a gun, and if I'm going to use it, I'm going to use it, period. But I think I think what Alan's talking about, too, is like putting some sort of legislative restriction on guns now, and maybe in 50 years we'll see a decline in some violence and things like that, too. I think all we that's have to start helpful. somewhere. Yeah, I think all of that stuff would help. But I think the biggest, the biggest problem is dealing with the fact, why are people so violent? You got people carrying guns who aren't violent. 
You got people and, carrying guns who are getting altercation who will not use their guns and will walk away. You got to understand the problem with guns are people being cowards, people being immature, and people not being trained properly with them. And but, it, you know, but you know what? For 100 years, it took over 100 years before Congress passed an anti-lynching bill. Exactly. Do you think, do you think, do you think they're going to pass some kind of gun uh, bill? No, yeah, they, they, they create, no. They're creating too much fear in the first place. So if you create this kind of fear, you know, me and Al talk all the time, but I really believe it started back in the Bush administration when we stopped talking about Justin. We started talking more about revenge. And after 9-11, what did the president of the United States say? Hey, we're going to kill Ben yeah. Laden. He didn't say we're going to go find Ben Laden and bring him to justice. We're going to go out and kill Ben Laden. You know, then you got Trump saying all this, all this hate and all this violence and everything else. We look to our leaders to follow our leaders sometimes. They, they set the tone of this country. We got to be honest about it. They set the tone of this country. They're the problems up top. That's what, well, what about your uh, your documentary? How did you get involved in that? We were, I've been working on a lot of stuff and I'm telling you, I'm like overwhelmed with a lot of stuff that I mean, a lot of people, I don't even call them now because people are trying to get people out of prison. There's just so much stuff going on. But me and Charlie and a bunch of guys and the Byron uh, Goglin and Dennis uh, Nemec and Vanessa and just a, a whole team of people got together. We just got tired of these kids getting killed out here in the streets through gun violence and everything else. And we said we need to do something. So we're going to set up a conference. And it's, we're trying to still set it up for this year, at the end of this year sometime. They think in September. But we wanted to make a film that kind of, you know, demonstrated this is what's going on on both sides of this gun violence thing. People getting killed, the victims. You know, we even have a, a scenario where the person that killed that little girl, his brother was killed. You know, his, his father had been shot. His mother had a brother killed. It's just, it's so much violence out here. And we just wanted to bring it to the forefront and say, hey, look here, guys, while we debating about guns and arguing about all this other stuff, we really forgetting about the real issue and it's protecting our kids. You know, and it's not just with guns. You know, just recently, that little two-year-old that got kidnapped, she was killed. And, you know, it's allegedly said that he used some sort of blue cord or something or a pink cord or something. Oh, charger cord, yeah. Yeah, charger cord or something like that. You know, that wasn't a gun. Like I said, people will use whatever they have available to them. But the real deal is, is we're a violent nation right now. People are angry. People are going through mental illness, all kinds of depression, everything else. And nobody's really addressing those issues of private poverty, everything else. People are angry. And like I said, you get an angry coward with a gun, he will go do something cowardly. And that's what these guys who do mass shootings, these little cowards that do sh shooting up a uh, house and stuff, because nobody will just fight with their hands anymore or talk right. out or just walk away. It's, it's braver right. to walk away. Ira, let me, uh, you, you and I talked about this a little bit about, you know, violence in the, in, in the cities has been, as you say, going on forever. Now we see, you know, suddenly there were white people doing mass shootings and their two parallel worlds have now sort of intersected where there's concern, much like the drug issue where heroin was an inner city issue. And then suddenly we saw white suburbanites overdosing and, and so how do you see the gun violence? Does it matter now that we're not really seeing a lot of movement, even when suddenly white people are like, oh, my God, we've got a gun problem? It's just like anything else, like this parallel universe. You know, we get more coverage when you see a lot of violence towards white folks or a group of white folks or a group of white kids or things like that. But like you said, in our inner cities, you know, we have all kinds of shooting in the neighborhoods and things like that. that it's every day, every day, all day. That's right. I mean, it, it is. I see it every day, all day. <laughs> and the lodge is CW cases I have. It's ridiculous. And the lodge in I ninety six is the OK Corral. Because if you look at somebody, they might shoot you. They might <laughs> shoot your car. But but look look what look at this. What everything's happened. Everybody's turned. Everybody against the police. You know, we have isolated incidents where police do a lot of wrongdoing and some wrongdoing. But those isolated incidents are just a small percentage of what police do bad, you know what I'm saying, that, that goes on. But they take the focus away from the real problem. So now you tie the police hand. Nobody respects the police. Nobody respects the rule of law. Nobody respects the Constitution. you got the Trump people questioning the, the reality of law and, and government and everything else going against the FBI. 
you're going against all of our structure that's been set in place. And now everybody's wondering why the world's going crazy because they allowed it to. And well, anyway, so uh, in, in closing, Ira, uh, your, your conference, you, your, when you think uh, it, it's going to take place? They think sometime in September. They're trying to save up for September. And they're trying to get, all of us are so busy doing different projects and things like that. So they're trying to set it up for September uh, for a law enforcement conference. And we try to really get it together. And we want to show this film. This film, uh, it's been reduced from about an hour minutes to an hour. And Brian Goggle, uh, he is like one of the best center photographers you ever want to be in your life. But this guy, he turned a mess into a masterpiece. And uh. we won three, I mean, I'm being honest too. We won three awards, you know. Charlie is uh, an investigative reporter that I'm telling you, he's probably one of the be best investigators I've ever seen out there. He know how to dig and get his stuff. And uh, just the whole team. I mean, they were really, it was more about saving kids' lives than trying to, you know, put this dark shadow in Detroit or over the country or whatever. Like, like, what are we going to do about these kids? Have you shown it in any schools? We showed it like uh, at different film festivals. And like we won Central Michigan Film Festival. I think we won the eight. Film festival. Brian is like entering him into all different things, and he surprised us a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and we had won Emmys. Each of us won an Emmy for our best documentary, and he won an extra Emmy for our best editing. And it just you know, it surprised us. You know, we were just trying to do something that would send a message. And I'm telling you, when you see this whole film, it's powerful. And we talk to the victims, we talk to the perpetrators, we even go and talk to one of the perpetrators who actually try to shoot a, uh, shoot somebody else, paralyzed a little girl years ago. On the anniversary of the year that he paralyzed a little girl, he gets shot multiple times. He's in the hospital, but he doesn't die. So somebody- well, I, All right. All right. All right. We, we're going to have to wrap it up because we have two other guests coming on. But of course, you always welcome to come back on the show. We're going to have you back on the show. And we, we want you on the show live. I don't want I want to see you in person. <laughs> okay, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm looking a little rough these days. The old man. <laughs> right. You got a lot of knowledge. Thanks. All thanks, right. Sarah. I, pre I appreciate that. Thanks, Al. Good right. talk. Good man. All right. See thanks ya. so much. Thank All right. Just, we're going to go to commercial. We should remind people that we are broadcasting live today from McShane's at the corner thanks, of Michigan Bob. and Trumbull. Thanks, thanks Bob, Bob Roberts, uh, the owner of McShane's. Uh, the food is great, the, the drinks are great. Yeah. <laughs> and we're also asking that you like, subscribe, and share. Like, subscribe, and share. Detroit in black and white. All righty. Okay, we're going to go. Break. We're going to do a little commercial here. I'm Wayne County Treasurer Eric Sabri. We are living through unprecedented times. As a result, the Michigan Homeowner Assistance Fund was created. This fund, administered by the state of Michigan, is designed to help homeowners cope with pandemic related hardships such as delinquent property taxes. Residents may apply for up to $25,000 to help cover 2019, 2020, and 2021 tax years. Previous year's taxes must be paid in full or in a payment agreement with the treasurer's office. Eligible homeowners must have a qualified financial hardship that occurred on or after January 21st, 2020. You must currently own and occupy your home as your primary residence and must have owned it since January 21st, 2020. To see if you qualify, please visit waynemetro.org, call 313-388-9799, or email taxinfo at waynecounty.com. We're here to help. Well, welcome back. Uh, welcome back to the Black and White. I made off Mongo, Vanessa Moss, attorney Vanessa Moss, Alan Langle from Deadline Detroit. Well, our next guest, uh, our business, uh, Real estate partners from Brightmore, uh, Michael Williams and Al Stone. All right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, you know what? You know Brightmore gets a bad rap. You know, uh, if you look at the history of Brightmore, it was a working class neighborhood. It was a city at one time, an uh, unincorporated city where Detroit annexed the neighborhood back in the 1920s. All these little areas at one time used to be uh used to be cities and you know if, if they changed the laws in michigan because if they could annex 
communities like they used to, wouldn't he be any down river? Right. It'd, be all, it'd be all Detroit, et cetera. But anyway, uh, Brightmore had hit on some tough times uh, in the last 20, 30 years, but uh, what's going on there now? Let, let me say, first of all, we put forth a resounding effort to not listen to the people who put a bad rap on Brightmore. Um, it's no different than anything else in the city. You've got some areas that uh, need attention and you've got some areas that don't. So um, I went through and, and purchased up some property in the Brightmore community, uh, in particular on Burgess Street between Linden and Acacia. And uh, it was uh, it had some challenges. So we went through, we cleaned up some of the illegally dumped items that were there. Uh, we, we chased out some of the crime element that was there. We uh, at, actually had some homes raised to the ground and uh, created a park, I created a park that I named after my mother. It's called the Ethelger May Williams Park. And this is our third year of having free uh, events and activities uh, for the general public to come out and enjoy. So, uh, you know, for our viewing audience, this is Michael Williams and this is Al Stone because I don't want them to get you guys mixed up. So tell us about the, <laughs> you said what, Al? Far from that, he's more handsome than that. <laughs> so tell us about the the event the upcoming event that you're going to have it's going to be at the park in brightmore absolutely yeah we have uh we have scheduled live music events featuring local talent uh we have a health festival we have a food festival coming up we do two classic car shows per year and this year we're we're adding in what what's going to be a whole lot of fun we have something called the Autumn Club, and the Autumn Club is an exclusive group of humans who are greater than 50 years of age. So we're going to have a senior activity weekend, oh, September 9 and 10. Say season. 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 Well-seasoned and experienced. <laughs> yeah, well-seasoned and experienced people. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, wow. And, when, uh, you know, I'm in, I love cars. I love automobiles. Okay. When, is, when is that going to happen? Well, we have one in the fall, October the 15th. And, I'm sorry, 14th and 15th of October. We call it the Friends with Classic Cars, and any vehicle that is 30 years of age and older is welcome to come out and display. Um, I have a 1926 Model T and a 1990 fire truck, decommissioned fire truck that I got from the city of Gross Point. So we will have all kinds of wonderful antique and classic vehicles that will come out. Wow. Um, the, you have, you're going to have an upcoming event this month, right? A concert series? We do. Could you tell us something about it? Um, He's a spokesperson. He, oh, Al doesn't want to talk. He just want to sit here and have people look at and, him. And be handsome, ahead, yeah. Uh, so we have something called the Brightmore Music Series. And every Tuesday we have from 5 o'clock until 8 p.m. live music featuring local talent. Now, this started in 2021. So this is our third year. We had eight in 2021, eight in 2022, and we'll have eight this year. But here is an addition to it. Next Saturday and Sunday, July 15th and 16th, we're going to kick off that series with two each day additional concerts. And the first day, the 15th, a week from today, we've got a uh, songstress that everybody is probably familiar with, Kimmy Horn. Oh. She'll come out from 5 o'clock yeah. until 8 o'clock, and she's going to wow the audience with her melodic and majestic voice. So um, our park is at Burgess at the corner of Acacia. 14300 Burgess Street, and it's free. We want you to just come on out, bring a lawn chair, bring a blanket, tell a friend, come on out. We'll have food trucks, we'll have merchandise vendors, and we'll have lots of melodic music walking through the park. Oh, that's let, awesome. Let me ask this question. Uh, the population over in Brightmore, uh, what's the estimate of, of community folks that live over there? You know, I'm, I'm not privy to what the actual estimate is. I, I will say this. Uh, Brightmore has um, a number of vacant air, vacant spaces, so uh, we are very well populated with deer and rabbits and groundhogs. We have a little red fox that runs through our park, uh, and I think it's just a beautiful area. So um, I'd have to get back to you with the statistics on actual population. But, you know, uh, Detroit has a, a, a lot of land and stuff, and, and, and the the biggest criticism uh, in the last 50 years is that all efforts have been downtown and, and some of the surrounding areas. 
when when is the city going to start moving forward to some of these areas that really need the help? You know, they they got the money. They get they get these billionaires all the money. They give them tax break. They give them four hundred million dollars to build stadiums and everything else. Well, we're going to have to have you trumpet that sentiment over toward City Hall. Uh, <laughs> I've been, I've been talking to, about it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm ready to participate. Uh, we've put some development plans in place about six years ago, and uh, we, we haven't, it hasn't come to fruition. Uh, we have not had the cooperation that we were hoping for. Oh, well, we need, we need to. We need to do a lot. We need to do a live remote over there in and Broad and 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 Brightmore and 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 just show folks that despite all uh, the bullshit that in the city, that there are people that are doing stuff that that uh, just trying to make a difference. And I am glad that y'all came on to talk about all the good things that's happening instead of talking about the doom and gloom that folks like to throw at the city. Right. So <clears throat> I'd like to thank you guys for coming um, to talk about what's going on in Brightmoor. We certainly are going to have invite you guys to come back. Now that you know that we're on the corner of Michigan Avenue and Trumbull, um, and we applaud what you guys are doing over there in Brightmoor. Thank you. Thank you. If I can just say that anyone who wants to come out and get a view of our schedule, williamspark.org williamspark.org and then navigate to the schedule so or you can go williamspark.org forward slash schedule and you can see the entire season lineup right on that website we we want to thank michael williams and al stone thank you very much and we're going to take a break and come back with our final thoughts thank you thank you i'm wayne county treasurer eric sabree we are living through unprecedented times as a result the Michigan Homeowner Assistance Fund was created. This fund, administered by the state of Michigan, is designed to help homeowners cope with pandemic-related hardships, such as delinquent property taxes. Residents may apply for up to $25,000 to help cover 2019, 2020, and 2021 tax years. Previous year's taxes must be paid in full or in a payment agreement with the treasurer's office. Eligible homeowners must have a qualified financial hardship that occurred on or after January 21st, 2020. You must currently own and occupy your home as your primary residence and must have owned it since January 21st, 2020. To see if you qualify, please visit waynemetro.org, call 313-388-9799 or email taxinfo at waynecounty.com. We're here to help. Well, welcome back, and uh, I want to thank uh, all our guests, uh, uh, Michael Williams, Al Stone, Ed Sarpolis, Ira Todd. Uh, I'm telling you, it's been a, it's been a great show. <laughs> uh, Alan Langle, your final thought? My, my final thoughts. Can I just play as my final thought? Uh, I want to play this about gun violence. You want to ban drag show readings to children? To my Why? House, yes. Why? Why, why, what are you protecting? Why can we prohibit children from voting, those under 18 from voting? Is, is that free speech? They can continue to exercise their free speech, just not in front of a child. Why? Because the government does have a responsibility to protect. I'm sorry? The government does have a responsibility uh -huh. in certain instances to What's protect children. What's the leading cause of death amongst children in this country? And I'm gonna give you a hint. It's not drag show readings to children. Correct, yes. So what is it? I'm presuming you're gonna say it's firearms. No, I'm not gonna say it like it's an opinion. That's what it is. It's firearms, more than cancer, more than car accidents. And what you're telling me is, you don't mind infringing free speech to protect children from this amorphous thing that you think of. But when it comes to children that have died, you don't give a flying fuck. They sure don't. <laughs> and that's, that's my final thought there, so. Uh, but now, my final thought, um, you know, I started off with my outrage and the fact that we're mourning the death of winter. Um, you know what? There's cause to celebrate. We see that there's life and things going on in Brightmore. The other thing that I like to say is something that I want to start next, last week and I forgot because we got so caught up with some things. I want to do a shout out to everybody that has a birthday today. Okay. Happy birthday. And we're looking forward to another spirited conversation next week 
at McShay's on the corner of Trumbo and Michigan Avenue. Well, thank you. And I want to thank uh, Henry, Teresa, and Jim uh, for making this broadcast uh, possible. Uh, I'll be back uh, in the D next week. Uh, same time. All right.